Um, just say, well, for this one. So we're looking at the start before that with the Battle of Beersheba, the 100th anniversary. Uh, it was between the Ottoman Turks, who in the First World War, so were in the First World War, for those who need it spelled plainly, um, and the Ottoman Turks were in control of the area known as Palestine at the time. It was only known as Palestine or Palestinia uh, since uh, 132 AD. So if you have a map in the back of your Bible and it says Palestine at Christ's time, cross that out because <laughs> it wasn't Palestine at the time of Christ. Yeah. It was Palestine and only started being called Palestine at what 132, 137, whatever it was, AD. So um, the Ottoman Turks were there in that area. Uh, They've been there for a long time, a long history. Um, and they were allied with Germany at this time in the First World War. That's who they decided to make their alliances with in the First World War. And we, I mean, we've seen the video. Most of you've seen the video, Kelvin Crombie's DVD we watched uh, and put it on. But obviously, it was very important to the British to have this area uh, because of the Suez Canal and Egypt and all the uh, significant things. It was an important route for us. So, for our own purposes, it was important, but also in God's purposes, it was important. And because there were, uh, through the centuries before, people had talked about the restoration of Israel, it was understood in the British psyche at that time that the restoration of Israel was something that should happen and was going to happen. And at this time, uh, we see and we'll come to the events that were taking place at the same time as the Battle of Beersheba. And if, it, if this uh, battle had been unsuccessful, then it would have meant the modern state of Israel wouldn't have come into being. So it was a, a key point, a key moment in the history of the modern state of Israel. And a key moment in God's purposes. That's why it's significant. It was the start of the rest restoration of Israel. Uh, and these are just pictures of uh, the graves, the memorial, the graves there at uh, Beersheba, where this battle took place, of Anzac and forces and British forces, people who gave their lives in the battles that took place there. But I just want to obviously take you to the word um, because these men are fighting over a bit of territory, many of whom don't understand, maybe some of them do. Allenby certainly was the general of the forces, leading all the forces at that time, knew the Lord. Uh, when he eventually they won and they got into Jerusalem, he got down off his horse and he said he wouldn't enter the city of his king on a horse. He walked into Jerusalem, he knew the Lord. Uh, but other people just were were conscripts or were, were, were fighting in the war because that's what they were doing. I'm not aware of the absolute significance in God's purposes for this, this land and for this time. But in Genesis chapter 28 uh, and verse 10 I'm going to take you to a lot of uh, Old Testament passages just quickly. Um, and that, therefore you won't have any excuse for falling asleep uh, but to see why this was important that we're not just making it up maybe we're, maybe we're Zionists maybe we're caught up with the political idea of the return of the Jews to the land but I trust by the end of all these passages you'll see that we're not uh, that's not what it's about so there in Genesis chapter 28 and verse 10, it said, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba, this very, or Beersheba, as it's called in English, Beersheba in Israel, this very place where this battle took place. And he went out towards Haran, and he came to a certain place and spent the night there. And because the sun had set, he took one of the stones 
uh, of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching into heaven. And behold, the angels of God were descending and ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac, uh, the God of, your, God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. In the land in which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. And your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the east and to the west and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you and will keep you. And wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until you have done what I have pro- until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. So it goes on. Wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land. That's what God said to Jacob, to his descendants, to Israel. And then 1 Kings 8. So we're going to go through some lots of passages. Because it wasn't the first time the land had been promised to the descendants of Abraham. It was there right from the start with Abraham. But here 1 Kings 8 and verse 33. Another promise to the children of Israel. And when your people Israel are defeated before an enemy. Because they have sinned against you. If they turn to you and confess your name. And pray and make supplication to you in this house. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your people Israel. And bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. Okay. Jeremiah uh, chapter 12 and verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 14. Thus says the Lord God, concerning all the wicked neighbours who strike at my inheritance, with which I have endowed my people Israel, behold, I am about to uproot them from their land, and will uproot the house of Judah from among them. And it will come about after I have uprooted them. I will again have compassion on them, and I will bring them back, each one, to his inheritance, and each one to his land. Uh, Jeremiah 30, a few chapters on. Jeremiah 30, from verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says I will also bring them back to the land that I gave their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Next two chapters on, Jeremiah 32 and verse 36. Now therefore, Jeremiah 32 and verse 36, Now therefore, Thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning this city of which you say it has been given into the hands of the king of Babylon by sword and by famine and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them in my anger and in my wrath and in my great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. Ezekiel chapter 39. Oh, uh, this is just a portion of the passages. If I read them all, we would still be here till next week. 
Ezekiel 39 and verse 25. Ezekiel 39, verse 25. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. They will forget their disgrace and all the treachery in which they perpetrated against me when they lived securely on their own land and with no one to make them afraid. I will bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies. Then I will be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God because I made them go into exile among the nations, and then gathered them again in their own land. And I will leave none of them there any longer. I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord. I promise for this future restoration. Amos 9, uh, verse 14. Amos 9. Keep going through the prophets. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. If you've gone to Zephaniah, you've gone too far. Amos chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. Also I will restore the captivity of my people, Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them And they will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. Most of you have eaten the fruit of the land. And I will also plant them on their land. And they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. And then one last passage from Jesus in Luke chapter 21. Verse 24, a well-known passage from the Olivet Discourse, Luke 21, verse 24, just one verse. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Does it sound like a political idea? Or does it sound like something God said throughout the word? Whose land is it? It's God's land. And who's he given it to? The chosen people. Jews. Israel. It was never in doubt if you read the Old Testament. Unfortunately, we decided to stop reading the Old Testament in the church and we got very confused. And we got very political, and we just decided, well, maybe God didn't really know what he was talking about. But it couldn't have been clear in his word. It was their land. He'd bring them back. He was always going to bring them back. And you know, us as a British, we like to be helpful and come up with helpful ideas. We decided that the Jews, it might be helpful for them to go to Uganda. Because oh. that would be, well, you know, Uganda's a little bit less politically sensitive. Of course, the Jews said, why would you go to Uganda? It has nothing to do with their history. They knew their Bibles, but this was a land God had promised them. And eventually we got some people in high places who acknowledged that too. So while some of those passages relate to an earlier regathering before Jesus' time, the point is being made repeatedly that God saw that this was the land, their land. That it always belonged to his people. So the start of that restoration really goes back to this event, this great battle. And so we see these war graves here in Beersheba. It wasn't free for Israel to come back into the land. Some people gave their lives. In fact, in other battles, there was a much more significant loss of life on the way to this battle. Uh, They've been defeated twice at Gaza. They've been defeated at Gallipoli. And yet, 
all these people who are giving their lives, who are actually giving their lives for something so much more important than the British Empire. They were fulfilling the word of God. They were fulfilling the restoration of Israel that had been promised for so long ago. And fulfilling uh, these promises written so long ago. And it was so interesting that it was here at Beersheba, the, the place that was so significant to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The fulfillment of the promise of the land. It didn't come cheaply. And we had our own interests. But these men sacrificed their lives. And they would pave the way for the establishment of the state of Israel. As you remember, particularly um, amazing at the same time was that we were also in the government making this declaration that would become known as the Belfort Declaration. We'll get to that in a moment. Show you just some more pictures. So, in celebration of this uh, anniversary, uh, this is our group. We, here we are at just uh, in Beersheba, in the streets of Beersheba, where there's going to be a march past. And it was busy. Lots of people came out to see this march past. And uh, here they are, um, gathered round about. You can see it's pretty busy. And uh, oh, I've got the wrong video. That's what happens when you don't prepare. And Kelvin Crombie walked. He led the Anzac forces down here. That's not him spinning the baton. That's the Israelis, they came through first. Um, so that's not Kelvin. Maybe he's on maybe he follows them next. Which one's this one? So this this one here, there's a marching through. Kelvin is the next group through. Kelvin Crombie. But it's the end of the video. Wow. Anyway, so he then led a group through there. Um, and that was great, and we'll see him again in a moment. Uh, it's Paul Haynes. Um, and General Armby, there's a statue there in, uh, in Beersheba of General Armby, the man who knew the Lord, who was leading the forces. Um, Paul Haynes actually played General Armby um, in Jerusalem a few days before. So, And this is at the event uh, commemorating the Battle of Beersheba. Uh, and centre on the stage is Kelvin Crombie. Uh, and Netanyahu, who I can't pick him out on this picture. Uh, um, so they had this wonderful event uh, to re commemorate this event. And Netanyahu was there, and there's Kelvin Crombie so, talking about how significant this event was and the purposes of God. We're all kind of mentioning the Lord, but constantly pointing them back. This was God's intervention. As well, even though it was uh, to celebrate what the Anzacs did, and there they all are. They had a, well, it wasn't a cavalry charge, they walked. But. So that was that in Beersheba. And then, as we're saying, at the same time the Belfort Declaration was made, we watched the DVD, and it was happening at exactly the same time as this battle in Beersheba. An amazing uh, event coming together. And so uh, some of us went up and uh, to the Royal Albert Hall and we celebrated on Tuesday just this week at the Royal Albert Hall this event, the Belfort Declaration. Because again, these two events came together to begin the restoration of Israel. And we had played a significant part in that. And so uh, it's actually at the end um, and some people have left. But it was pretty full. There's a good number there, and we had a good time. So, that's the Battle of Beth Sheba. And we played an important part in the restoration of Israel in the, as a nation. And it's an important message for each one of us. Sometimes we play a small, or even a big part in someone else's story. Are we looking to the Lord as to how we can play a part in the bigger picture of his kingdom. Because it's not all about us. And here in the UK, maybe they were a bit concerned about us, but some people there were concerned about the restoration of the state of Israel. They were looking to the bigger picture, to God's kingdom and what he's saying in his word, and they were concerned about that. And so they acted for that purpose. 
And so often we can just be caught up with, well, I, I want God's purposes to be fulfilled in my life. Uh, I want uh, the things that God's got planned for me to come about. And whatever else happens, happens. But this is a very kind of looking outwards at the bigger picture. And so often we can get caught, so caught up with ourselves. And some of them, these men bravely gave their lives up and fought bravely for something they could never have foreseen. But they, for some of them they knew they were meant to be there involved. God will give us a chance to play a role in a much bigger picture than our own lives. For the part of his kingdom, for a part of his purposes. And for those people who fought at the Battle of Bathsheba, they played a, a, a part that seemed in their own lives just uh, it's about survival. It's about not being killed in this battle. It's about taking that water, uh, that water well and and those small things that was significant for their purposes, but the bigger picture was so much bigger than just this one battle that would lead to the restoration of Israel, that would lead to eventually the Lord returning. And so the message, I guess, and the lesson for us is that we shouldn't get caught up in the, the me. Because sadly for the UK, they would got caught up with the me. And they never played the full part that God had intended for them. We opted out of the plans and purposes of God as a nation and said, well, we've come this far, but uh, actually now it's going to cost us too dear. We don't want to fall out with the Arabs, so we're going we're gonna to play both sides off against each other. And we failed. And Great Britain ceased to be. And the empire ceased to be. And we paid our price because we didn't fulfill the purposes of the Lord. But we did that up until the point. And for some of us, we can fulfill God's purposes in the kingdom of God up until a point. Or we can fulfill fully what God has for us to do. And if we do, we'll be involved much better. Much have a much better kind of, uh, as we were thinking about this morning, on our tombstone. The things that be rem- would be remembered for. Would it be like Britain's role, who we're... We celebrate this, but have to say, oh, after that we did awfully, and we have to kind of hold our heads, hang our heads in shame for what we did after that. It's like what it be when we stand before the Lord for our own lives. Well, let's pray it won't be so. Well, that was then in Beersheba. I want to take you uh, north to somewhere very different. Uh, and moved back in time 1,900 years to a place co- called Capernaum. Um, because, uh, and let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read this passage on the screen. Matthew 4, and we'll read it for verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, John the Baptist, and he was John the Baptist, but never mind, he withdrew into into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and he settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of um, Zebulun and Naphtali. And this was to fulfill what was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, a people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the light land and the shadow of death, upon them the la- a light dawned. And from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. During this trip, we had a great guide, uh, best best one I've had on any tour of Israel. Uh, he was a believer, and he taught us so many things. But for one thing I really struck about was what I learned about Capernaum. Why Capernaum? It says that Jesus settled in Capernaum. It's, it was his, it became his base. 
for his ministry. It's where he stayed. It's where he kind of lived. It was his home. And so, why Capernaum? Why this place? What was significant about it? It's not really mentioned, apart from this prophecy we have in Isaiah. It seems such an it seems quite an insignificant place in biblical Old Testament history, at least, because it was quite a mixed area. But we have this phrase by the way of the sea, and where it's mentioned earlier in the passage, which is by the sea. I think that's probably a, a translator trying to explain what that means. I'm getting it all wrong. Because by the way of the sea actually means something in history, in, ancient, in the ancient world. By the way of the sea was a, a huge trade route uh, called the Via Mares, the way of the sea. Um, this was a, uh, there at Capernaum, this milestone. Because it was a trade route. It was an important junction for the world throughout the Middle East. Um, and so, if you can just about to see, uh, you've got Capernaum there. And this is this trade route, and it goes through uh, Megiddo. Come back to that. Uh, and it comes through, up through this little valley here. And this is all flat, you see. It's a, a valley. So it's easy for people to travel through. Uh, and if we had the bigger picture, you'd see everyone, they come up through Gaza, through uh, by, the sea, by the sea here, this sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And then they come up through this valley, then to Galilee, because there's fresh water. And then they go up, and they go from there to Damascus, they go up through there, or further into Europe. It was a very significant place on the trade route, not in biblical history. But actually in the ancient world at this time, it was a very significant place. Because people crossed paths. It was a, I'm trying to think, well a bit like in London. And all the trains, they either go into, they go into London and they go out of London. You can't really go across without going into London. Well that's what Capernaum was like in the day. And so it was a very significant place. And well... So we see in the stories, um, go with to Mark uh, chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue... And began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one with authority. And not one of the, not as one of the scribes. And just then there was a man in the synagogue. With an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying. What business do we have with each other? Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet and come out of him. Um, And then we we kind of see all all that happens. And then verse 28. And immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all surrounding districts of Galilee. Why did the news spread everywhere? Because it was a trade route. People were there. (laughs) They saw what happened and they went out into the nations. They went out into the nations. Now, when Jesus was uh, performing miracles and and healing people uh, and had revelation about who he was, what happened? What did he tell them? He told some not to tell them, tell anyone, didn't he? Others, though, he didn't. Others, he did the exact opposite. Have you ever wondered about that? Because I certainly have. I've often looked and thought, why does Jesus tell these people don't tell anybody and some other people don't tell. Not, sometimes it's go and tell the scribes and Pharisees and that's because they were Jews and they, they were then allowed back into public life. But for most of the people, all the people who told go and tell, they were Gentiles. And all the people who were told don't tell, 
They were Jews. He was saying to the Jews, don't tell because until I've been resurrected. Then tell. He didn't want them to fail to do what they were meant to do, which was to crucify him. They weren't, if they had accepted him then as a Messiah, then God's purposes wouldn't have been fulfilled. But to the Gentiles, he wanted them to know. And the message went out throughout the Gentile world about this Jesus. Preparing the way for when Paul went round all these places. And Peter later. Uh, and just another verse in John, you don't need to turn to it, but John 6, verse 59, it says, uh, These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Uh, there is the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, the white stuff from, see this line that goes across here? And that one's black down there, black stone, and that's white stone up there, even though it's dirty. Um, this is the synagogue of Jesus' day. And this is from the 4th century, it was built on top of it. So when it says, and Jesus went into the synagogue, that's where he went. And he was kind of standing there, but obviously on top of, underneath. Um, in Magdala, just to kind of give you the better point, um, better a picture, uh, this is what they found there in Magdala. This is, uh, so this was only uncovered four years ago. And this is the synagogue as it was in Jesus' time. Magdala, what, is, what, do, what connection do we have with Magdala in the Bible? It was for Mary. Mary 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 Magdalene wasn't a surname. It wasn't Mary Magdalene surname. It was Mary from Magdala. And we call her Mary Magdalene, but her name was Mary from Magdala. And that's where, we, where she was from. And there, this is a synagogue where she was from. Um, yeah. Uh, now, in Luke 7, we see uh, Mary, from, or we assume it's Mary, kissing the feet of Jesus. And it says in Luke 7 that it's in Peter's house. Where's Peter's house? Well, there's a bit more of this synagogue. Let me just show you the rest of it. This is all in Magdala still. Original, there's a mosaic on the floor. Notice that uh, it's, an ar- it's basically the ark. Completely ori- not, well, it's not the original, but it's a copy of the original because the original's in a museum. But the ark's there in the middle of the synagogue. And this is just that down the road, just outside of the synagogue. And these are all baptistries, as we would have them. Mikvah, the washing before they go into the temple. See, they didn't, they didn't sprinkle water on the heads of the children. They baptized them like they had had the experience of understanding that they would be washed and cleansed. Actually, probably not like we do it either. They dip themselves in the thingy. But then, we're, we're going off our point. Uh, but there is, this is back in Capernaum, and this is the city of Capernaum. You can see that awful monstrosity that they've built? That's Peter's house under there. Um, but they've ruined it, but that's what, I mean, it would be just like all the others, but they actually found something in there that made it clear that it was Peter's house. Um, so when it reads uh, in Luke uh, 7, and Jesus says to him, to Peter, since I've come into your house, you've given me no, or you've not washed my feet, you've not done all these things, and she hasn't stopped washing my feet with her tears. That took place over here, because it's in Capernaum. And Peter's house was in Capernaum. And the uh, synagogue was back here. I'm taking a picture from the steps of the synagogue there. And there's Peter's house. Uh, we see all these things that happened in this place. And it was that God had a purpose. Jesus had a purpose in being in this place. None of this happened by accident. He was in a place where the message would go out to the Gentiles. And he was coming for the lost sheep of Israel. And he was bringing a message to them. 
But he also wanted to be in a place where the nations would hear. Where the message would go out abroad. And so he ended up in this place. Not by accident. But by the purposes of God. And that we the Gentiles might come to hear about him. And so the message of Jesus went out round and about. Uh, just one last, uh, there's a, a boat, uh, Jesus' boat. So when you imagine Jesus and the shipwrecks and uh, or the, uh, being on the sea and then being worried about sinking, it's because they were in a boat like this, not a cruise ship. Okay? That's, that's been restored from Jesus' time, found in the mud. Right, so... Uh, the, you remember me saying this is a valley well this is on top of Mount Arbel uh, which is part of that edge there's, a, there's, a, there's Capernaum, Capernaum up there and Magdala down there and this valley we're just kind of seeing just comes up through but they come up through do you know what goes the other way so it goes up to Galilee and then on to Damascus do you know what goes the other way well it leads into Anyone know where that is? This is the end of that. If you carry on down the valley, you just keep going, you'll land up in this place. Know where that is? No, it's not the Dead Sea. No, we don't have to go down the Jordan River. Valley, oh well, it's Megiddo. What's Megiddo? If I say Har Megiddo. What does that sound like? In fact, we read it in Revelation 13, uh, 16. Armageddon. That's where we get the word Armageddon. This is Armageddon. This is the valley of Megiddo. The plain of Megiddo. What do we read about that? Well, we see that all the nations will come against Israel. In Revelation 16, verse 13. And I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, three unclean spirits like frogs. And they, were the, they are the spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief, blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes on so he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered and they gathered them together into the place which in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. That's Greek translated. Megiddo is a Hebrew. The plain of Megiddo. He gathered them. Guess what? There's no battle of Armageddon. <laughs> Sorry. What did it say? It says they gather. Oh, Armageddon. Armageddon. Well, where are they going? Where's this last battle going to take place? If it's not going to take place in Megiddo, Armageddon. Israel, yeah. yeah. Keep going. Yeah, and then where are they going? Jerusalem. We're all going to Jerusalem and this is on the way to Jerusalem. And look how easy it is to get tanks down this road. When these armies of the east, which way will they come? They'll come in this way. They'll go around that way. And into Megiddo. Look what the British did when we were going up through. Which way did we go? Through Megiddo. It's nice and easy to take tanks and people through there. And armies through there. And look, this is the fertile crescent. All these Arab armies and Babylon and all these places. And there's the routes straight through to Megiddo. Well, they're going to lose anyway. They're going to lose anyway. But it's just interesting sometimes when we see the geography of a place. When we see... How it's all laid out. Our Lord's got it all planned. He knows all that's going to go on. Even the last great battle. And if he was right about the restoration of Israel, which he was. If he was right about Jerusalem, which he was. 
then I think we can safely say he'll be right about the last battle. And, as Alan said, they're going to lose anyway. The whole armies of the world, and what I didn't read was Zechariah 14. Uh, Zechariah 14, verse 2. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, and the houses plundered, and the women ravished, and half the city will be exiled. But the rest of the peoples will not be cut off from the city. Which half? It's going to be East Jerusalem, isn't it? So it's already kind of half controlled by the Arabs. And then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. All the nations of the world are coming up against Israel. And we can see it today. And we're not far away. But the Lord knows it all. And the Lord's going to come back and fight for his people. Well, if the Lord's got his purposes, he sorted out Israel being restored, he used us as a nation, he used the battle of Beth Shevri, used us as a nation politically to grant the, the, the Belfort Declaration on the very first same day. We've got nothing to worry about. It may sound terrifying, but the Lord's coming back, and he will win the battle. Let's pray. Father, it may have been a very jumbled look through some uh, things that we considered while we were away. But Lord, we do pray that you would help us to be encouraged by the wonder of the things you've done in the past. The plans and the purposes, the, the fact that you planted your son in Capernaum to reach out to the Gentiles even then, to be that light in a place of darkness, to deliver people, to set them free. Lord, we thank you that you're still doing that today amongst Jews and Gentiles. Lord, we thank you that you're not saying to us, keep it quiet anymore. But that we have the opportunity to shred, shed that noise abroad before we get to the last days in which you will return. Well, we thank you that you've been right so far and we can have every confidence that nothing will take you by surprise. Even though it distresses us when we see the nations ganging up on Israel and abusing Israel and blaming them for everything. Well, we thank you that it's still fulfilling your purposes. We thank you that it hasn't taken you by surprise. And we pray that we would be a people who look upon these end times with confidence, not with fear. Because you have seen it all. You have been there already. And you go ahead of us there. Well, thank you that one day we'll be gathered to Jerusalem, not for battle, but gathered in the air with your son as he returns. Praise your name. Amen.